There we go. How's it going? Good, good. How are you doing? Pretty good. Yourself? Excellent, excellent. You want to get rolling? Sure. Excellent. Sick. Here we go. Hello and welcome to episode 32 of Speaking from Water. I'm your host, Sean Rutke. This is the program where we bring you water legends. And today we have an extra special guest, Dave Nielsen from the great state of New Jersey. Dave uh, had the opportunity of uh, just totally crushing that swell that came through a couple weeks ago. Uh, we all uh, saw it on our news feeds. It was an epic event, and we got him here today to to kind of give us the rundown of the of the happenings from that swell and give him a give us a brief history on on his uh, his life and uh, how he became um, so pronounced in this uh, this art of surf photography. So, Dave, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, uh, my, my my most important question here is: Was this swell last uh, uh, December eighteenth as big as a, a deal as Superstorm Sandy? Um, in a different way, Sandy was destruction for us, whereas this one was minimal destruction and mostly rideable waves. I don't think anyone in New Jersey really surfed sandy because it hit us so hard interesting so i'm based down here in riceville beach and <clears throat> excuse me we, we had a a side sandy experience and i remember you guys got totally slammed and i remember there were big waves from that event and i had not even um seen anything like i saw coming out of uh the material you were posting um on the east coast uh, i mean for those who hadn't um view these pictures we're talking four times overhead surf is is that what uh you would say you saw yeah it's something i haven't seen in new jersey before um i've seen it in hawaii or fiji but that was never something i thought i could walk up my street and actually see because i didn't think our beaches would ever hold something that big so coming into the swell did you what did you anticipate Honestly, I thought it was going to be a washed out mess and no one would be surfing. And then the next day it would be good. Um, they were the forecast said 20 to 25 foot at one point. And I was just like, uh, I don't think that's actually going to work. Like if it does, like it's going to be a mess. No, nothing's going to be rideable. It's just not going to work. And then when the day actually came and I saw it in person, I was like, that's what it is. And it's actually working. I didn't think that could actually happen here. So what do you think it was? The angle, the way your beaches were set up at, at this current moment? Oh, what do you think? I think it was the angle of the swell. I think it was a bit more east. We got a bit more swell than we were expecting. Because um, I remember it was supposed to be south. And just when we saw everything coming in, it didn't look like it was like reeling rights or anything like that. It looked like it was kind of like a decent amount, like kind of closed out. But there were some makeable ones. But the wind went offshore hard and we'll get storms like that. Maybe not as big, but the wind will, it'll happen overnight. The wind will go offshore and the next morning, it'll still be six to eight. It's like, well, what happened at night? That one, the wind went offshore at like 10 in the morning. So we had a really good window of just the maxed out. It could be of with the size and the groom shape. Cause it, the wind went offshore at like 20 miles an hour and cleaned it up pretty quickly. And then, I've never seen faces that side actually, size actually hold up in New Jersey where people could catch them. It, it, it was absolutely incredible. Excuse me one second. Sorry, Dave. So how long uh, ha have you um, uh, been shooting? What, what I want to know, like, what's the, the beginning story of, of Dave's trip into the world of, of the ocean? So I've grown up uh up the street from the beach my entire life i think i started shooting in 2008 or 2009 and then right around that time i had a buddy that was like hey man like you got a camera can you come take pictures of us surfing and i was like all right so i shot literally probably the same spot that i took that photo in um from two weeks ago and after that i was hooked like i wanted to shoot surfing all the time i saved up for the water housing like i before I could afford the water housing, I bought like that plastic bag housing that you put in um, and just swam out just thinking like, all right, I, I already bought a new camera. Like if this thing gets punctured, 
I'll, I'll just throw it away and I got my new camera on the way because I just wanted to get in the water so bad and just shoot surfing from a different angle. So so how old were you at this point? Um, I graduated high school in 2009. I was 18. So I was probably 17, 18 when I started shooting. And now I'm about to turn 33 in a week. So over 10 years at this point, shooting surf photography and photography in general. And did, did you grow up in, in the, the coastal area of New Jersey? Yeah, I've always lived up the streets uh, from the beach since I was yeah. seven, eight years old. Um, been able to walk up the street like right now. I keep my longboard uh, under the deck, walk up, uh, surf that in the winter because um, 90% of the time it's not that big. It's more manageable for me. But um, yeah, went to school on a barrier island uh, elementary school town. So I'm from the um, the Maryland uh area uh ocean city that was kind of my home beach growing up the the northeast uh is a is a cold and rugged place i would like uh, you know your your photos that really spoke to me most were your water shots from um your news feed and i and i was blown away by your ability to get so deep in a barrel um to get to get the surfer because i i understand and just from doing work myself that that's a very hard position to get into um it, when when did you get the water housing and when did you really start feeling that skill of how to get into such cold water? Because the water up where you are is just frigid in the winter and that's usually when the best waves are. So kind of um, introduce our, our listeners to the um, the sequence of events that allowed you to, um, to, to get into such a great spot in these waves and, um, and what's your philosophy on that? Um, so I first got a water housing. I'd started at the plastic bag housing, like right before I got like my regular one, um, 2010, 2011. And the first day I swam out with it was, I remember it was November 30th. Um, it wasn't freezing yet, but it was still cold. You could go in without gloves, but you needed boots, um, and a four, three. And I wore all those. I was completely out of shape, but like I somehow got into the lineup got a couple shots, then my fin broke and I got washed in and I got like one shot of a cresting wave. And I was like, oh, like, that's it. Like, this is what I'm doing. Um, and from then on, it was like, all right, get in better shape to get in the water, get a better wetsuit. And like, when I started swimming, like, it was rough doing it in the cold because I was using surf boots and jamming them into oversized fins. And with surf boots, like, they just don't want to conform to the fin. Like, they want your foot to be kind of like that. And eventually someone told me I, uh, they made bodyboard socks. So I started wearing three mil with five mil on top of them bodyboarding socks. Like, all right, these are much more com comfortable. They're not cramping my feet as much. And I just continue to go from there. Like I, I, when I wasn't shooting, I was body surfing to understand how to be in a better position um, and get deeper in a wave. So I body surf for years. Like I, the first time I went to Fiji in 2013, I was body surfing at cloud break um, in between shooting. And I think that really helped me get super comfortable being in the water and shooting. Cause it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm just out here having a body surf. I just happen to have my camera. And I realized that you, you can take a lot more risk with a camera and fins than you can with a board because I can easily swim under. Whereas like a board, if you can't duck dive that deep enough, you're just going to get smoked. So tell us how that was going to Fiji for that first trip, going from such a cold environment where it's literally super difficult to swim in such gear as you were just describing to then being fully natural. What was that sensation like? Um, it was amazing. Unfortunately, the first time I was there, I wasn't that close to the waves because I was still in college and I just found a, a school out there to study abroad. And it was like, well, I'll, I'll be four hours from cloud break. I'll make it there. So I, I got there and then it went from like, oh, I'll go on the weekend. To, I'm blowing off my final exam reviews to go to cloud break because Kelly Slater, Mick Fanning and uh, Joel Parco were going to be there. And I remember telling my professor, I was like, yeah, like, I can you like write some stuff down for me? Because like, I know it's really important, but uh, I got to get to cloud break tomorrow because it's going to be like really good. Dave, was that that super swell that that is very famous? It was about that time period. And you um, can still that, check it out. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
I know exactly what you're talking about. That was the year before. I was gotcha. that was 2012. I was there in 2013, and I remember seeing that that swell. I was like, oh well, I have to get to this wave somehow because I saw how big it got and how perfect it was. Like I want to see that, and I yeah. never. Got, I don't think it's been that big since and that perfect. There, there's been days because I know some people out there that have shown me photos, but it's never been that perfect all day long like it was for that world tour swell. Yeah, for anyone listening, you should go check that out. It was a uh, a, a famous, uh, I think it was like three hours on YouTube and Kelly Slater commentated that a bit of it and it's just legendary footage. But so th that that's that that session gave you some inspiration to get out there. Let me ask what um what were you studying in college and wh where where were you studying um i was at rowan university in southern new jersey um i was studying geography because i had no idea what i wanted to do and i took like a trip one summer as a geography class i was like can i travel around like this if i majored in this like yeah um and then i found the university of south pacific in fiji and at that time i had taken most of my classes so i just needed like gen eds so i could I could take them and get them out of the way. And the, the school there was pretty lenient. I think all you needed was a 50% to pass a class there. And all my classes came back pass or fail. It didn't matter the letter grade anyway. So like there was a lot of time kind of like skipping class and like jetting over to cloud break or like the local wave there. Epic. So, so that, that was the trip that got you to cloud break predominantly. Yeah, and then I went back and uh, I, I met my friend Stu there in 2013, and then in uh, in 2016 he asked me to come house sit for him um, for the summer in Fiji. Um, he was like, "Can you watch the dogs? Um, you could uh, go on the surf tour to make some money. You just got um, you got my place to stay at, and then all you got to do is pay your way out here and pay the utilities." And I was like, "I'm yeah, I'm there." Um, barely had any money scraped together enough for a plane ticket and then got out there and then spent like June through August there. I was there through some of the world tour and I wanted to go so bad and I didn't think I was going to be able to because I had just spent like the winter traveling. I think I went to Hawaii, Nicaragua that winter and I scraped together enough money to make it out there. It was so worth it to spend like their swell season on the boat there because I got to see some amazing waves, uh, a lot of pros out there, and just so amazing surfing in general. Stick. So that that trip was a very formidable trip. The the second, uh, it's 2016. We're three years past. You're really uh, coming into your own in photography. At, at what point during this trip, three years later, what were you working with equipment wise, and uh, kind of how did your philosophy of taking photos change by that point? Um, at that point. I still had my 7D and I had a 5D Mark III, which I still use today. Um, I had my Essex housing, which I still use. And I was I was shooting the 7D a lot. And then I bought, I couldn't find um, a 5D Mark III back for it, but I found a 5D Mark II that I jammed my 5D Mark III into. So not like most of the controls didn't line up, but I could get to the shutter and that's all, and the trigger and that's all re that really mattered. So I swapped between those two cameras and, a lot of time spent shooting on the boat because like someday I saw one day that was massive. They were towing and it was like something I've never seen before. Um, but mainly when I got out there, I, I kind of wanted to push my own limits because like it, it it never gets that big here or one day every 10 years it will get that big that as cloud break does kind of regularly. Um, so I wanted to swim out on some good days and get some water shots that I wouldn't necessarily get a chance to do back home. And and how um how did those sessions go? What kind of lenses were you choosing? Uh, um, and and uh, having not having that be the extreme, what was your preparation mentally for going to like like when you judged this was too big or or the conditions? How how did you judge all that? Um, so I had been training for like a year or so prior. I was biking twenty miles a day, like couple times a week just to be in shape to do it um i had done some breath hold training because the first time i went to hawaii i got like smoked and i just did not like did not had never felt power like that and i was like all right i gotta be in way better shape um lens wise i shoot 50 a lot it's very um universally good for everything for me um rarely am i like too close 
or too far away, I can generally judge pretty good where I need to be with 50, where it's just like, if you're shooting fisheye, you're either in the spot, or you're getting no shot at all. Um, so I shot some fisheye occasionally, and there you get to, um, to do the whole underwater thing, which is amazing. So I shot some fisheye um, and definitely got um, some underwater stuff. On the bigger days, I tried to shoot more 50. And at that point, my fisheye and my 50 were the only things I had ports for. So those are the only things I, were use I was using in the water. Um, but on like the biggest days where I got the best shots in the water, it was generally the 50 millimeter lens. And I'd say most of my best water shots are probably with that lens at this point. Okay. So, um, and a lot of that probably has to do with the fact you're sitting more in a channel and at that spot, it's harder to get in the lip. Whereas these Jersey shots, New Jersey shots, I'm seeing you take, uh, look a little more fisheye. Is that, is that right? Or are those fifties also? uh some are fisheye i shot it like i wanted to get fisheye down because that was like the classic surf perspective in magazines so i shot a lot of fisheye when i first started it was like the only lens i used then i moved to more 50 because once i realized that like my success rate for fisheye like you may get three amazing shots that session and then you won't get anything else i realized if i'm shooting 50 i'll get a lot more okay to decent usable shots and then some really good shots um, versus walking or possibly walking away with nothing at all. Um, so I've shot a decent amount of fisheye, but 50 has been kind of my go-to. And as I've moved on with that, I've sold the fisheye and used six, my 16 to 35 occasionally. And then I have a 135 when I, that I like to use when it's the current's like ripping. Um, but even with 50, it's not like on a full frame, it can still be pretty wide. I've got gotten some photos where I've, some people would probably think I'm shooting pretty wide where it's 50 because it, it'll be someone standing in a barrel completely covered um, and everything's still in frame. Um, and I'll still get smoked shooting with the 50 just because sometimes it's going to close out right on top of me and there's nothing you can do. And while we're on the subject of your travels and, and your history, I want to go back to your first trip to Hawaii because that seems pretty fundamental to your journey here. Um, how did that come about and what was it like your first session uh, I, I assume you were in Oahu on the North Shore. Is that is that where you went? Yeah. Um, and 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 kind of tell us tell us how that that felt. You know, the, the first the intimidation of the scene, and then that first session, and, and give us the story of that session. So, my one friend said we should go to Hawaii, and I was like, all right. He's like, no matter what, it'll be crowded, but it's something you need to see. So we went out there for two weeks. And then when I was on the flight to get there, the Yeti, uh, the Yeti was on yellow alert. So I knew it was going to be big like the first couple of days. And within, I think the second day, it was 20 foot Hawaiian. There were 40 foot faces um, at Waimea. And I think they called off the Yeti um, because it wasn't going to be 20 foot all day. It was just going to peak at 20 foot. Um, so the, first two days like all right well i'm not getting in the water everyone there's jet skis out there people are towing um it's gigantic i'm not prepared for this at all um when the swell kind of started to come down um i got to kind of get in a little bit um i remember one day um after um the swell was that big we were staying right by kiki beach where clark little always shoots and the massive swell just took all of the sand off the beach and created like a little sandbar where they're like on the beach, like there was a bunch of exposed reef. Um, and I looked at it, I was like, it didn't look that big. Um, and my, me and my friend were like, Oh, like, let's go out there. We'll get a couple shots. Um, it, it looks like a sandbar, like at home. And I knew the swell was rising, but I just hadn't been to Hawaii. I didn't know how, how quickly that could change. And just, I remember we started swimming out and then like, right when I thought I got to the lineup, it was just like those classic, like lines stacked to the horizon. I was like, oh man. Um, and I remember the first one I swam down and grabbed the sand and I was like, all right, I'm good. And it ripped me off the sand and then pummeled me. And I was like, I'm out of my island. I don't know what I'm doing now because I can't get under these safely and there's nowhere to go. And then that had like, I think there were like six waves in the set. It kept, they kept hitting me at one point, my buddy like bounced off of me and then just like took his board and just like cruised in. And I was just like trying to get in. But at that, like at that spot, I remember 
the current just kept you in one spot. So I wasn't making any ground getting in. I wasn't making any ground getting out. And I was just taking wave upon wave on the head of like the biggest waves I had experienced at that point. And then eventually I just stopped like trying to get under them and let them hit me and uh, like wash me in. And I remember when I actually got to the beach, I took like three steps and my legs just like gave out because I was just like gassed out of oxygen. I was like, wow, like that was the biggest welcome to why I've ever had like I, I was not expecting that and it just completely put me in my place like I had never been put in before because that you you will never get the Pacific power in the Atlantic. <laughs> so ha have you felt this power? Um you say you'll never feel this power in the Atlantic. Uh kind of tell our listeners um even with that swell that you just had, uh what how is the power not the same? Well, on the East Coast here, our coastline is not nearly as deep as the Pacific. So there, a lot more power gets into Hawaii, especially because it's the middle of the ocean. Um, and it's just so much raw open ocean swell. Where with, if you look at the bathymetry here, it's much shallower compared to the, uh, the Pacific Ocean, um, even, even California um, and like the entire West Coast. So the shallower it is, it will take a lot of the energy out of the waves before they get here. So that Pacific power, you you just, you get it a lot more on the West Coast and Hawaii, and it's not something we get here just because we don't have that deep open ocean swell. And those places will take those 15, 18, 20 second period swells, whereas here it just spreads out and closes out our beaches for five blocks if it's 18 seconds. Um, so it's just not the same. If you were getting that 18 seconds all on one like in one wave, it would be gigantic. And it just doesn't work the same here because of the uh, the bathymetry. So this this famous shot that you took that looks four feet over uh, four times overhead. Um, what 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 would you say that that wave was? The one where the guys uh, eating it from the top. Um, I stumbled upon a video on Facebook where someone used a fence measuring software because they worked for a fencing company. And they measured it at approximately 22 feet. On the face? On the face. So I sick. guess that's probably accurate. I, I know I saw 20 foot faces that day. And then some that didn't quite like stand up as much were, I think were bigger than that. I know how big Brendan is. Um, so I'd say that's probably pretty accurate. And and what what struck me most was the ability for the, the surface that day to paddle out through such... Um, because the the white the white water must have been um, terrible to deal with. Uh, how how were guys making it out? Were they jumping off piers, jetties? Um, what what was the common method? Did you see most not able to make it out? Uh, were the ones who made it out and even dropped in? Was that an anomaly? Um, kind of give us the lay of the land because I know a lot of people who weren't there might armchair that swell and say, oh yeah, I would have paddled out, but um, it was a pretty extreme event. Yeah, so. At least where I was, I think there were only about 15 people that actually gave it a go. Um, I had friends that wanted to do it. I had friends that like I talked to and they're like, I want nothing to do with that. I don't want to paddle out in it. Even if I got out, I don't want that. Like, it just looks like you're going to get hurt or you're going to break your board and just no one's coming to help you today. Um, I saw some people get denied. Most of the people that paddled out were pretty seasoned and, and they got out there. The upside of the spot. Um, that that was taken at um, is it generally breaks pretty close to the beach. It was breaking further that day, but it still wasn't breaking like super far out where it's like nothing like ocean beach or anything like that, um, which makes the photos even better because you, they're that close to the beach. Um, so I saw a lot of people making out and there's there was no jumping off a pier or jetty. Everyone was just paddling through it and just taking them on the head and then just getting out there and it's even more impressive because it, it seemed like there was a very small window where there was a break in a set to actually get it, like get out there. I saw a lot of people taking massive waves on the head and just being in the wrong spot. And there was just no way around it. Did anyone try to swim and shoot that, that swell that you saw? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't seen any photos 
from the water or video from the water, at least from that day. I know a lot of people swam the next day, but I haven't seen anything that day. Uh, you, did you consider it? No. Um, I'm not in the great, in the best shape that at least that I was a couple of years ago. So I, I know my limits that was beyond it. And as a photographer, you got to chalk it up to, am I even going to get a shot? And with the current, the size and the way the waves were moving that day, you could have killed yourself to get out there and then ended up with not even an empty wave shot that even looked good. Cause I, I, I've swam decent sized days and just, Sometimes you get killer shots. Some days it's just like, well, this wave's really big, but you can't really tell because no one's on it. And you, there's no landmark in the background to really judge the size. Epic. So you, you go out that day. What was kind of your land philosophy when you go to shoot land waves? How, how do you structure your mind as far as angles, uh, perception, uh, lens choice? What's your, what's your philosophy? Generally, I'm always shooting with my 100 or 400 because it's pretty... Um, versatile um generally i try to get a foreground that day it wasn't as important because the surfer on the wave was the star and gave it the size so you could just zoom in and just anyone on a wave was going to look amazing that day because of how big it was whereas if it's six foot kind of average you, you kind of want a foreground something to make it look interesting that day all the interest was the size of the waves and getting someone in the frame with the wave. Um, I, I saw a couple of pictures from further up north where people got it, like we're standing like on a building way far back where you get the boardwalk and buildings in it. And to me, that was per like a perfect way to display the size without someone in it because there weren't that many people that surfed that day. I don't know how many people paddled out elsewhere, but in the spot I was at, there was about 15, maybe a couple more guys out the whole day. What was that spot? Are you able to tell us? Um, at this point, it's been in every news outlet, so I'll say it was Bayhead. <laughs> Sick. I'm not, I'm not going to give a direct street or anything yeah, like yeah. that. But... No, no worries. No worries. Uh, let's rewind that tape back to, uh, to the Hawaii. I'm interested. Did you go and shoot other spots on that trip? Uh, yeah, eventually I swam out to pipe. Um, it was smaller than it had been, but I wanted to try it because, you're there, you got to give it a shot. And I remember watching it like the entire two weeks I was there. And I think like one of the last nights I actually swam out. Um, and there's a channel there, but you can't really like swim in the channel. You have to like position yourself like right in front of where it breaks or further down because you're going to get swept down the beach and then aim to like get out when you're near the channel. Um, which so, all the pros that surf there and make it look super easy. And then like the photographers that like shoot there all the time, like they're out there in no time, but it was my first time there. It's like, uh, I'll give it a shot and got out. It, it wasn't as big. I don't have really impressive shots from Piper or anything like that. It was more of just like my own experience to like get out and see it. Um, but I, I think it was a learning experience and then it prepared me for going to like other trips and other places and then we're coming back here and really realizing like all right you can you can give it a shot here because like it, it's not going to be anything like that yeah totally the the north shore is the mecca and a uh, pipe is a rite of passage for surfers and water photographers and i can understand on that trip you were uh you're probably um looking at it the whole time you you were searching in your soul for the courage to 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 get out there and tell us, tell us about that, um, uh, that search for the courage of when, when you are a, a water photographer, uh, to, to achieve that goal. Cause I, I, th I think there's probably a part in your mind that, that said, I don't want to get back on that airplane, not having done this on this particular trip. And, um, what year was this? I believe this was 2015. So a year, a year before your big massive year of adventures, and and you need to um to 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 not i guess you know not do the thing that you need to do tell us where that courage comes from yeah i remember being there and like the first day when i saw like pipe actually breaking and saw how far out it was to get and like how big it actually was when someone was standing on a wave i was like wow like that like is something i never had seen before and i wasn't ready for it and I was like, well, I have to try it. And then like when I got put in my place at the sandbar that one day, 
I was, I was like, uh, like, I got to give it another shot. Like if I don't get out there, I might as well just sell my camera and just forget this. Um, and then uh, eventually the, like the last day, I think it was the Super Bowl. Um, it still had some size, but it was more focused on off the wall, which everyone said, it's like, yeah, unless you're experienced, don't, don't shoot there. There's no channel. Like you're either going to get smoked and you have to be comfortable with that, or you'll get lucky and you won't. Um, the upside of pipe is the channel, but if it's massive, you're still going to get the wash throughs that are going to close out the channel. But that day I, I got out, it, it wasn't that big at pipe. I have some photos from pipe looking at off the wall where it looked a lot better. Um, but it was more just like getting out there and like seeing like, there's no other place like the North shore. Cause you'll, you'll run into like all of your childhood heroes in a matter of 10 minutes, just standing around pipe. So the amount of pros you just see there surfing, and that was during the Super Bowl that day. So a lot of people weren't serving. I think there was like one or two other people actually shooting in the water because it wasn't that great. Um, it was just a great experience. And even though like I don't look back at any photos I got from shooting that day and be like, that was an awesome photo. It, it was my experience to go out and experience pipe. Um, and then it prepared me for, I think a week later, um, I was headed to Nicaragua to work for a surf camp. And I remember I was really shook by, uh, by the sandbar experience. Like, how am I going to go... Um, shoot for a surf cam when I just got rattled trying to shoot a sandbar on in Hawaii and then slowly just continuing to shoot and I just got my confidence back up and then many more trips later and then many trips up and down this coast I was like 2016 17 I was in the height of like being in shape and like ready to swim big swells and just I was I was out there anytime it was six foot or bigger I wanted to be in the water so sick. So you make it out of pipe and now you have an extra uh, ownership over the camera. You know, it's, it's, a, it's your sword. You've leveled up on uh, the black belt, so to speak. Um, when, when did you feel like you were developing your own personal style and how, how does that uh, work in your mind as an artist and um, you know, your ability to change your uh, and also your go-to moves with your equipment? I would say around 2017, um, that was, I think I had stayed around here that entire year. Um, and at that point I had traveled a decent amount and like I had used my equipment a lot and I was confident enough to get in the water in the middle of the winter when it was really big. Um, and I remember in 2017, we had one storm that was, uh, they called it winter storm Stella. And I remember I woke up at like 5 a.m. I thought there was going to be like a foot of snow. And then we all got, we got all rain. And I got to this spot probably like two hours before the wind even went offshore. And it was just gigantic. And I was looking at it. Um, and I was like, it looks like it could be really good, but I don't know about shooting water. It looks like you may not line up for a shot. And then I, Rob Kelly paddled out. And then um, Jay Rakowski was like, oh yeah, I'm swimming. I was like, all right, well, I want to get, I want to get water shots. I'm not going to stand on the beach. So I grabbed my stuff. I swam. Um, I think Jay had broken a fin. He got like a couple shots um, and then he had to go in. Um, and I swam and I remember like I was, the spot that I was at had like, it was really deep to really shallow. So the lips were really thick. It wasn't that it was so like huge. It was just that the lips were really thick. And if you really took one, you were going to get really pounded. And I made it out without getting smoked too bad, got like a bunch of shots. And then right before I was going to get in, I just took one right on the head. Um, and it didn't even hold me down that long. It just like planted me on the bar and then ripped me off the bar and shot me right back up. So it's not like it was a long hold down. It was just like violent. Um, and then I was gassed from that session and we went up north and then everyone was saying that it was 12 foot plus there. And when, we, when I got there, everyone was in the water, I put on my wet five, four and swam back out. And I was the only one in the water for like an hour or two. And then the size started to come, come down, more people swam out. Um, and then I overnighted it to New England that night to try to swim again when it, further up north where the buoys were hitting 20 foot. Um, and I remember like that swell, I was like, all right, like, I'm pretty comfortable other than like the lack of sleep. I'm pretty comfortable in the water. I know where I want to be and I'm not like paddling for the horizon when a wave comes. I'm like trying to get in the perfect spot where I'm going to get a good shot because you can be out there when it's really big. But like if when a set comes, you're paddling for the horizon 
you're not going to get the good shot. And I, I learned that. I think the first time I was in Fiji, I was really scared to like take one of the sets of cloud break on the head and just get dragged over the reef. And then like the second time I realized, all right, I think that's going to break there, but it's going to break further in. I should swim in, not out. And that's how I ended up getting good shots. It's just like not being afraid to take the wave on the head and just learning the timing better because the more time you spend in the water, the more you'll be able to read a wave and be like, all right, that's um, there's no way I'm in the position for that. That next one, swim in, be in that right spot, and then I'm going to get the shot. So it's your time spent connecting with nature that that really fosters the the art as as you as you see it. Yeah, I would say so. The more time you spend in the ocean, the more comfortable you're going to be. The more you're going to just know how to anticipate how a wave's going to break, like. If you look at all the best pipe photographers, they're out there all the time and they're so deep and in the sketchiest spot and getting the most insane shots. And then like every year I see a new shot from pipe where I'm just like, I don't know how they got that and lived. So you were talking uh, when you're in Hawaii about your heroes, who, who are your heroes growing up Who are your current heroes? Uh, I guess even uh, let us, uh, know some uh, legends we might not know about up there where you live um so like local heroes surfing is definitely sam hammer um i've surfed with him i've shot with him and every time i just see him in the water he just he knows how to read the waves here exceptionally well and just at, generally anytime we get a good swell he's getting the best ones and he's also a super nice guy and really fun to surf with who will call you into waves and just like, yeah, man, you got it. Um, maybe not the wave that you should be taking at your ability, but he'll be like, that's going to be a sick one. Go for it. So I've had that happen to me more than a couple of times. But um, as far as photography heroes, um, Brent Bailman stands out as like one of the best fish eye photographers. I've always like looked at his shots and just been like blown away. Um, Local guys, I've I've looked up to Ray Hall Green because he was getting shots of this area in surfing magazine, surfer magazine, probably before I was born. He he showed me a couple of his own his old uh, film housings and film cameras um, that he was swimming out to shoot casino pier in like the eighties and nineties, and just like the amount of dedication I had to take at that point to swim out when it's freezing cold. You know you have like thirty five shots. Um, and you don't know how they're going to come out until you get them developed in a couple of weeks. Um, I don't know if I would have had it in me to do that because now we have the instant gratification of it. you either see it in the water or for me, I don't, I don't have a review button. I see it when I get out of the water, but it's just, if you don't know how you're doing and you're sitting there in the cold, it's like, why am I going to continue to stay out here? I may have nothing right now. So sick. Can you can you tell us when you first were exposed to such imagery and uh, what did that do to you when you saw it? Did, did it instantly you say to yourself, whoa, I want a piece of this. And then that's what got you that that first water housing. What was the trajectory? And and do you remember? It was more my own photos and then like. Taking pictures during a swell and then finding it on Surfline and then seeing all the uh, pictures that came from my area of the same swell, whether it was New Jersey, the Outer Banks or New York. I remember uh, there would be a hurricane swell and then I'd see Matt Clark's photos like, oh man, those were like really sick. And like, he was like three miles down the beach. And then I'd see Daniel Pullen or Matt Lust down in Hatteras getting amazing water shots there. Uh, I'd say it was mostly the local guys here at least on the East coast that pushed me to want it, want it more. Um, because it, you realize like you do have those waves in your backyard. And if you're willing to go look for it, you can get it. And the East coast is such a timing thing and it's changed so much over the years, as far as being able to understand when a swell is coming, you know, we can forecast that out a lot now. And a lot of the young guys might take that for granted, but kind of, um, uh, speak to to the nature of 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 knowing nature and knowing what's what's going to come and how that's changed over the years for you. Yeah, now you have so many different ways to check the waves. You you have Surfline, um, Swell Info. You have Windy. You have all the models. You, you can look at everything and get some kind of idea if there's going to be waves. 
granted it you could still always get skunked i've like taken days off and then woke up in the morning and it's two foot when it's supposed to be eight foot it still happens but the best way to get good waves is to just spend time driving the coast and figure out what spot works with what's the what's well you're gonna get skunked but you're gonna you can get skunked at your local spot at least like when you put in the time to know like all right this spot works with this that spot works with this um eventually when i got to that point like i wasn't calling my friends to see where they were going surfing i was like all right i know it's going to be good here i don't care if there's no one out i'm going to get sick empties and i would go and just drive by myself and get to the spot half the time all the pros would be there because they thought the same thing sometimes it would just be me and like two or three other people but it's just putting in the time to drive up and down the east coast and there's no nailing it 100 percent of the time because it's almost all beach breaks here the sand's going to change and maybe it was good last week. All the sand's gone. It's not good this week. But if you have some kind of idea of wind direction, swell direction, that's going to work. You put in the time of driving around and figure out, but like finding spots and figuring out what works with what eventually you, you know what you're doing and you'll get some good shots that way. Even if you're just going to stand on the beach and go for a frames. And up where you live on the East coast, the, the angle of of the land is uh as such that it it's you, you don't have to drive very far to have a change in wind and and swell direction for a whole situation to change just based on the topography is it, and and how um how is that as a as a as a person uh when you're when you're trying to decide i guess you have the experience like you just said of of kind of knowing but um uh speak to this this aesthetic that that you find different when you when you go even more to a place that of um say maine or or um uh massachusetts area where it's rockier um what, what what's the what's that like well here it's all beach breaks so at that point we don't really have we have a couple spots that kind of like have a jetty or like a piece of land that juts out you kind of get like a point but generally, you know, here, anything over 12, 13 seconds is going to start closing out the beaches, um, unless it's like a really strong south angle where it, it hits just right. And like when, when you're getting east swell, that's like 14 to 16 seconds, you know, everything, almost everything is going to going to close out. You're just going to have to find that one spot that kind of has a jetty or a pier that's going to have better corners. Whereas when I've been up to New Hampshire or Massachusetts it's uh, New Hampshire there was a point break like every like half a mile it felt like we're just like you every corner we went around there was another point break whereas here it, it's a bit compact in the sense that you can drive an hour and switch from west is offshore to north is offshore and then if you want to go to Long Island distance wise it's not that far it's just if you're willing to deal with the traffic also north winds are going to work and you got a litany of other beaches where you can choose from i generally stay in new jersey because i hate traffic and i hate the drive to new york because if you don't time it right you're spending three hours sitting in traffic trying to get there because especially with like the rush hour so it's just like if, you, if you're committing to going there you're waking up at like 5 30 and then getting over to long island whereas I hate traffic and like if the wind for some reason switches west i want to be able to get back to my home break because i know how well they work um but it's definitely a blessing to be able to drive an hour and just get to somewhere what's going to work 200 times better than your current break so you're you're in new jersey how how are the 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 lips and you spoke a little bit earlier about the power of that lip that held you down Describe a little bit more about that, because when I see the photos in the videos, the, the lips just seem as heavy as it gets, as heavy as it can get anywhere in the world. Um, speak to the water aesthetic of 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 your, your beaches where you are. So the heaviness of the lips is going to vary on the beach. We do get a couple that are extremely heavy, and they're generally the most photogenic, so those are the ones I like to swim to. It's just generally going from deep to shallow and that's what does it like i talked to brendan and that that wave that he jumped off he said the it was four feet deep under him so it's all of finding where you have that deep water and then a shallow sandbar and that produces those lips and it's the 
best pictures. That's why I, I, I always go to Bayhead to shoot, or if that's not working, I'll go somewhere else um, to shoot there. Um, but I always try to find those shallow spots. Like I can go up my street and like, it'll be fun to surf, but it won't necessarily be super photogenic. It'll be a more almondy barrel, but we, I would say New Jersey gets some of the squarest barrels on the East coast, just because of the shallowness and the deep, the deep water going into shallow. So sick. Now, how, how does um, the, uh, the, the culture up there, you, you, you have so many people living in New York city, the New Jersey area. And from the outside looking in, it doesn't look like the, the surf is, is that crowded. I mean, there's a lot of people, but I would, think there'd be even more surfers um is the community tight-knit how how um from experience down here in north carolina you could paddle out say at our local break everyone knows each other um is it like that up there um specific breaks you go to are can be pretty localized where everyone knows each other there's just so much beach here and a lot of it will get good waves like if you want you can find a beach and surf by yourself um you can go up the beach and it may be better and you'll surf with 20 guys. Um, but generally not super crowded. And I think the cold kind of cuts down on the crowd because like in the middle of the summer, you can go to a spot and there'll be 50, 60 guys out. You, you could look at the Manasquan Inlet um, cam on Surfline in the middle of the summer. And it looks like there's a hundred plus guys out, especially during a hurricane swell. You will get a swell the same size in January there's still going to be a decent amount of people out at that spot because it's a good spot, but it's probably half of what it is in the summer because it, it takes dedication to suit up in a five mil and know you're going to be cold the whole time. Like I'm getting older. I want to do it less and less. I remember being in my mid to early twenties and getting changed in a pile of snow and getting in, getting into my boots, gloves, hopping in, losing feeling in my hands and feet for, hours i used to i would put in like seven hours in the water in january i'm in my 30s now i can't do it as much after like two three hours i'm just like yeah i'm pretty good i i haven't felt my feet since i got in the water i don't want to do it um so i'm going to say that's what cuts down the crowd a lot and when you see people in the middle of the winter you kind of know who surfs that spot because they're they're the ones that are there all year so the the being able to keep up with the cold seems like the thing that you really need to do most to to really excel uh, up up there. Uh, how how do people maintain such strong skill with so much uh, gear on? And um, are, does anyone? Tr uh, uh, what what like you're you're in your mid thirties you're getting less and less in into the the cold as you say. Um, is there a way to refoster that? How how does that how does that work? Um, I'd say being in shape would be the best way. Um, I I've talked to several of my photographer and surfer friends and the older we're getting, it's just like the cold gets to you quicker where I, I think that happens to everyone, regardless if it's surfing or not, you still do it. Cause you realize you're going to get the spot with a less crowd and you're not going to just going to stare at it and not surf that day because it's cold. You're going to do it. Um, just the older you get, the kind of the cold gets to you, your muscles don't work as well. Um, but it also works to your benefit because you throw on a five mil and swim out and then fly somewhere where it's warm. And it's just like, I feel this is so easy now because I don't have all this gear holding me back. And it goes the same with surfing. Like I, I feel like I can surf way better in board shorts than I can in a five mil. I, everything is kind of holding you back. So when the spring comes in the summer and you like get into a thinner suit, it's like, oh, like I got, this is easy. Like I can snap this turn. No problem. Because like, I, I don't have 15 pounds of rubber holding me back right now. hundred percent. And it's like, you give so much respect to these guys who are able to, to do it with so much gear on because personally speaking, summertime, I feel like I'm 22 right now. I'm 42, but I put on all this stuff right now and it's, it's, it's super tight. So while we're talking about the warm weather, what are some destinations that you haven't been yet that you want to get to uh, on, on the planet? Um, I mean, for a while, I wanted to go to Bali and Indonesia, but the more people I've talked to, the more of a zoo I've heard it is now. So as far as other places I want to go that I haven't been yet, um, 
some of the cold destinations seem interesting, like Iceland. I know that can be hit or miss. Um, as far as the warm destinations I haven't been to, there's some Caribbean island spots that I've seen that get really good, but you kind of like have to time it on a swell. So some of those like secret spots, um, yeah, I don't know. Like I'd like to time things in a swell. It's harder for me to do now with a full-time job because I can't just go in tomorrow. I'm like, hey, I'm not going to be here tomorrow through the next week. Um, I'll be back next week and I, I just won't have a job anymore. Um, but, uh, there's some spots in the Caribbean that I know get good. Um, and then I, I'd love to make it back to Hawaii and back to Fiji. Those were two places that were really cool. And I'm sure they've changed a lot since I've been there, but I'm sure they're still amazing. You, you did spend so much time in Fiji. Speak to the culture and the uniqueness of it and, and, uh, how that's kind of resonated in your life. Oh, the, the Fijian people are the nicest people you'll ever meet on the planet. Um, it is literally the happiest place in the world. Everyone there is super nice, super welcoming. Um, the only thing I saw was at cloud break. There was, since there, the locals are so nice, like people actually like were getting like pissed at each other because someone would drop in and no one would do anything. There wasn't that heavy local crowd. Um, so I, I couldn't speak en enough about how nice the Fijians are and how, amazing and a beautiful place that is like it truly is one of the most amazing places in the world and like when you go there it's one of those places where you get and it's actually as beautiful as the postcard as it is in real life so the the common denominator through all coastal towns is is niceness you might have your outliers where there's like a, a localism problem but i've only personally read about those in magazines i've never had anyone ever um be mean to me at the beach what is it about water what is it about the coastal lifestyle uh from your perspective um that it makes people uh love life respect nature um in, enjoy uh be nice um I think it's just that the coast is beautiful. And when you live in a beautiful place, it just, it makes you happy. You you want to be there. It's not like you're in the middle of a city and you just want to get out. Um, the the coast is, provides us with waves, provides other people. They just like to go and stare at the ocean and it provides them serenity. I think all of that just helps everyone flock to the coast and want to stay there. I've lived here for almost 33 years and, as much as I've traveled to other coasts, uh, I always come back and uh, I, I love the surfing scene here. I love the coast here. And there's, uh, I, I have friends that will, are in Central America right now and they'll text me as soon as we get a swell. I'm like, what is Jersey looking like? Is it good? I'm like, you, you got some of the, you got warm water. You got the best waves right now. It's like, yeah, but like, how good is it right now? They want to know because it's where they grew up and it's something about home. And when your home is the coast, you, you always are going to think about it. I want to I want to stick right there for a second. I want to hone in on the, on that. Uh, Jersey, what what is it? You know, I was just asking a real more general question, but specifically Jersey, like what's so great in your opinion about Jersey? For me, it's the waves we get. Um, I I love it here. I love when we get waves and just I I've been out of town and just like my friends have been sending me pictures of what it looks like. And I'm just like, oh man, I can't believe I'm missing that right now. And it's like, I, I I get it. Even like when you're like across the world and you could be in firing service, like, yeah, but like, what's it like at home? I, I think everyone has that, whether they're from Jersey or not. Uh, I'm sure of guys in California, when they're somewhere else, they know their like local spot is firing. They're just like, oh man, like, like P pass may be really good right now, but what's it doing at home? <laughs> So, so now we have social media. We can know in a few minutes what everyone's surfing experience is looking like. Uh, you grew up in a time, I grew up in a time when we had the way for magazines. Um, and even before that, they had the way for surfing movies to come out. Um, kind of speak to how things have changed in your, in your lifetime uh, with, with surfing media um, and kind of speak to where it is today, in your opinion. You know, you just went through a uh, super swell. Your your photo went viral. Um, in the back in the day, you you might have had to submit that photo to Surfer Magazine, and we wouldn't see it till a month later. Uh, so, kind of give us your um your lay of the land. Yeah, now everything is very instant. Um, there's like one or two print mags left. Um, 
So like holding off photos is not a thing. When I first started, it was like, you got your photos, you found the best ones and you submitted them. They're like, all right, don't, don't post this on Instagram. Don't show it to anyone. Um, we may run it in this issue. And then six months later, it'd either be running an issue or it wouldn't. And then no one cared at that point. Now it's just like, I posted that photo on Instagram and people wanted it immediately to run it, rerun it as long as someone else hadn't rerun it already. Whereas I remember when I started, like I'd have photos from a swell that I thought were really good. And then I post them months later after I found out it wasn't going to be in a magazine. At that point, no one cares because everyone cares when it happened, but no one cares about how sick a photo you took when it was a year ago when it actually happened. Um, so I've lost out on so many photos that like didn't enter them in contests, didn't uh, submit them, um, like post them on Instagram when it happened, didn't submit them to something that I would come out that week, like tried to save them for a magazine. And then a year later, I'm still holding on to it. No one's seen it. And I posted it. It's like, oh yeah, I think I remember that swell that happened like a year and a half ago. That that was, no, all right. So it, it's changed a lot. Um, no one holds photos. It, it's nice to get it instantly, but like that swell will be old news in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, totally. And now as a, uh, a photo creator, um, you, you, this isn't your, your full-time job. You have, you have another full-time job. What, what is your full-time job? Uh, I work for the state of New Jersey. Um, I'm Sick. a government employee. <laughs> Sick. So, so when you first started your photo career, did you, what was your idea of like making it a full-time job or were you, or did you have another trajectory? What was, I guess, your business mindset or was it purely artistic? Um, at first I just wanted to take photos because I like doing it. And then once I got more and more into it, I was like, well, like you could travel around surf camps, do this and that. And then the older I got, the more I saw like staff photographer is not a job anymore. There's just, <laughs> there's no print mags left. I think there's one or two. So like the competition for those jobs are just, it's insane. So at one point I was like, oh, I could probably travel around and like just go from surf camp to surf camp and sell photos. But at the end of the day, I don't think any surf photographer makes their entire income just shooting surf photos. You have to shoot something else. And I hated, sh I, I hate shooting weddings. It's not something I wanted to do. Um, I like shooting surf photos and landscapes and that was never going to be a career. And I, I did the traveling around to surf camps and whatnot, and it wasn't lucrative, lucrative enough to make money off of I, i'd maybe make my money back on a trip but i wouldn't make enough money to like profit from it so i'd pay for like my airfare and the time i was there and then i'd get back and be like well i paid for the trip but i didn't really make any money um and then the more that time went by i was like oh i guess i'll just do it on the side i i watched friends that love shooting start shooting weddings and they made ton tons of money they could afford all the gear they want they're just like i hate shooting for myself at this point because I take so many pictures of weddings that just like when I'm not doing that, I just don't even want to shoot. I don't care about shooting anymore. So at that point, I realized oh, I do a regular job and do it on the side because at least I'll still want to do it. Yeah, it's so complex and and deep. Where where do you see the the industry going? Because I, I, growing up here in Wilmington, North Carolina, we had a a, a guy where well, we still do DJ Strunts, and in his day. He was he was the number one dude making six figures at Surfing Magazine. You know, Surfing Magazine doesn't even exist hardly any, anymore, and uh, he does something completely different now. Where where do you see the 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 trajectory of the industry, the ability for surf photographers to become monetized? The same for surfers, really. It's like you almost have to go into a completely different um, genre of uh, even social media influencing to to make it a thing. Um, what's your opinion and thought on that? Yeah, so uh, I know exactly what you mean. I, I remember seeing DJ's photos and he's got amazing shots. I think he posted one of like old casino pier like a couple weeks ago. And I was like, that is an amazing shot. Hey, and, and, and dude, he still has it because he brought he dusted off his housing at the yeah, beginning. Out oh, in the yeah, outer banks. Yeah, you I, follow I saw, him, right? I saw that article. Yes, he, he's it's still, got still it. crushing it, still um, killing it. Yeah, up here we got Seth Stafford. He was the guy we all look, uh, looked yep. up to around here. Um, shot for surfing. Um, now, like, I, I never see him shooting anymore. Now he's just bodyboarding or surfing. He's just having fun. Um, but, yeah, he, he was the guy around here. He was the one going out, getting the surfing mag uh, fisheye shots. 
I've, I've seen so many of his shots from around here, but it's changed a lot. And unfortunately it just, it just doesn't seem to be a viable career for almost anyone. Like the photographers I looked up to, like they're still shooting surf, but I don't think they're making a big portion of their income from it anymore. It's just, everything's on Instagram. Everyone has a phone that shoots uh, photos and video everyone's got a camera now so it's just an oversaturated market um i it's unfortunate i i think surf photographer is not really a pro career anymore um i i think there's a select few that do it but I, i'd be surprised if you find anyone that's making 100 percent of their income just from shooting surfing shots so i want to switch the subject a little bit and go back to um, your style because you are predominantly water, but I was checking out your website and you have a, um, an Instagram sick aerial stuff. What was your avenue into aerial? And did you think that you were taken away from your, you know, cause there's only so many swells that hit and when they do, you know, like your sword is your, is your water housing. So how do you then decide to, Oh, I'm going to get a, a drone and and what's what's the balance like with that <laughs> so i was really late to the aerial game i remember seeing it and just like everything i saw was just like top down looking at a wave and i was like i don't really like that like that doesn't look cool and then i saw some guys shooting like pretty close to the water with their drones and taking risks and it was like well that's like a water shot like without actually having to swim and i was like oh i'll just swim out and it's like yeah but like how many water shot how many water shots can you get just swimming you're going to miss 18 waves and you can fly that thing around and you can get everything and then i like i saw some people killing it like ryan mack and cody hammer and they were just like they were getting so many amazing drone shots i was just like i gotta invest in one and then once i got it i was like oh i'll get, I'll get the license for it so i can get certified because i don't know i try to do everything by the book so i got uh, my license so i could sell photos um but yeah i, I love flying the drone now and video is kind of more the thing that people do with it i try to do photos it's a lot more difficult because you can get like one or two versus like holding down the trigger my 5d i'm going to get like 20 like a sequence of 25 um but if you want the actual raw photo to edit of the drone you're not going to get that like you can't get that big of a sequence um for a wave um but now the biggest obstacle with that is just the wind you know, half the time we'll get 30 40 mile an hour winds like ryan mack got insane footage from that big swell we got and i was like i thought about flying my drone i was like i don't think i'm gonna get it back like it's a 30 mile an hour wind right now and I, i've had friends that lost them they just like went out there like yeah i couldn't fly it back it would not come back to land um and they're expensive to replace um but it, it definitely takes a lot of the labor out of trying to get in the water and just when it's it's still freezing on the beach but it's a whole nother animal to suit up and when you know you're going to get more shots just flying around for 15 minutes than swimming for three hours it, it, it's hard to pass up yeah that's so deep how you describe you merge your water concept with the drone because that's exactly what i like most about that one video you have at the top of your instagram feed of you pulling back with that drone as it's coming and i know the fish eyes on those drones like that that drone had to be really close to that wave for you to get that perspective so big ups on that that was that was super super sick um before i let you go i kind of what is your advice to to kids to to adults with uh kid hearts uh, about getting into water photography photography in general we're talking about drone photography, the, the arts of uh, media creation. I would say just go for it. It's never been easier to get in the water and afford it. Cause like when I started, like housings were specially made. Um, they were made for DSLRs and like, it was a whole like $5,000 setup that you had to be willing to invest in. Now, like you can get your phone, um, get a housing for that. Like I, I got this spare camera for a hundred bucks and this, this water housing for 80 bucks like that that camera shoots raw photos you can get in the water for so cheap now you, you don't have to invest thousands of dollars so i'd say if you're thinking about it give it a shot worst comes to worst you give up about it didn't put thousands of dollars into it you put 300 dollars into it and let's take it to the most basic terms here because really it's all about 
capturing that that glory of of the water that brings so much uh, joy to the soul. Uh, can you can you kind of give us give us your perspective of of that? And when you and when you get that in your camera and you're able to take it home and then and then feel it again, um, is that what it's all about? That's absolutely what it's all about. I think once someone goes out and gets that first water photo that they look at and they're like, wow, like I still have it from my first water photo that I took. When I look back back at it, I'm just like, I remember that day. I remember being in the water. I remember what the waves looked like. And that was what it looked like. And after that, I was hooked. And you can look at a hard drive full of photos and just look back at 10 years of like surf experiences and swimming. And they all make you feel good because you the photo brings you back to where you were. And for me, it's where I was. For other people that look at it, they, it brings them to a different place. That's just, that's a, it brings them to an experience they had in the water. Um, and that's definitely what it's all about. I've had friends that were surfing and then had an injury where they picked up a camera and started shooting. They're just like, man, this is like really sick. Like, I'm going to stick with this. Like, now I don't know whether I should go out and surf or if I should go out and take some photos. And on that note, how do you deal with such a dilemma? Um, now it's more of my surfing ability. I know that if it's six to eight and it's 35 degrees, I'm going over the falls and possibly breaking my board where I'm probably better off with a camera. Hurricane swell, I'll surf when it's six to eight. I'll have a great time. But now it's just lighting and how photogenic it is kind of like plus my surfing ability. That's what I judge on whether I should surf or shoot. My friends that are better have a lot harder of a time. Because they're just like, I know I'm going to go out there and get so barreled right now, or I can take photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then you're out there trying to get barreled, and you, that light just pops off, and you're like, oh, running to the beach for that camera, right? Yeah, that's actually what I did with this housing right here. It's got a bunch of zip ties because I hung backpack straps on it because I wanted to see if I could make a camera that I could actually bring into the lineup and like surf with and then take it off and then take some photos. Which it worked. Um, it would probably be easier in the like the summertime without all the gear on. I think I tried it in the winter. And I pulled into a couple closeouts and then paddled out, took it off. But like with the gloves and everything, like I got some photos. It wasn't easy though. Yeah, and like like I thought about that too. But how is it like you can't do two things really good at the same time? It's like and and the surfing mindset is so different than the photo capturing mindset. You're you're almost two different souls in the water. I, I, from my perspective and um can you relate to that idea i can um but there's been times where i've like swam out on like a bodyboard to take photos because you're kind of more elevated because when you're in the water you're so close to the water you don't get that same perspective when you're like sitting on a board so there's been times where i'm surfing it's just like especially in the winter where it's like i just wish i had like i wish i paddled out with a camera because now i've caught five waves i'm gassed i'm like i got all this rubber on i know like i can catch more but with my energy level i'm not getting into it when i want to and like i'd be better off just sitting here and just taking pictures of the waves going by yeah absolutely um my my, my final question is uh is the aesthetic question and that is when you are um uh looking at at an ocean um, what, what is, what is your like ideal go-to setup? What is it that you see that you're just like, well, let me ask this a different way. Okay. So you're, you're looking through your role. You shoot maybe like 200 photos in a role. You go back to your house, you're looking at them in, in, in your, your viewer. Uh, what is it about the thing that makes you go, Ooh, from a whole session of, of it being in the same kind of conditions but what what is this aesthetically specifically in a frame that makes you just like oh that's the one that's like that's the one yeah um for me that would be the hollowness of the wave and just the way the lip is landing like i've i've looked through so many waves and it's just like there's something when i see a certain way that a, like a wave is breaking where i just know like all right that is it that looks good and just like where the lip is, it's just like, if it's like small and ominous, it could be 15 foot, but like, it doesn't matter because it's not throwing out into the flats, like where it, like, that's where it looks like you look at it and you're like, oh man, like I want nothing to do with that. Like you get smoke sitting right there. 
And that's what I always look at when I'm looking through my rolls of photos is just a specific look of the way the wave is breaking, whether someone's on it or not. If someone's in the barrel, like if you can barely see them because it's like clamping on them, it's not going to be good. But when they're standing there and you can see like it through the flats and they're standing there and they're still holding on, like, you know, that's the photo. And and is this unique to Seaside Park, the, the wave, the wave is in your mind, or could this wave be super sick, but say in Fiji? No, you get them everywhere. It's just some waves are going to break like that. Some aren't. And just uh, when it has that certain look, um, I remember the way uh, Stu described uh, Fiji when it's on, where I was like, you keep calling it six foot. Like that's bigger than six foot. He's like, no, six foot is just an expression. It's just like, when you know, like it's solid and it's perfect on the ledge cloud break where you're like, you're getting barreled, like that's six foot. And I was like, yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> Well said, Dave. Well said. Uh, before I let you go, I have a macro question. Um, what's the meaning of life according to Dave Nielsen? Uh, happiness. Everyone's just trying to be happy, I'd say. So find your happiness. Yeah, wherever that is, whether it's in the ocean or doing whatever you like that makes you happy. I think I, that's all anyone's looking for. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. You've enlightened me to so many factors that um, I, I haven't thought of, and it's been a joy to, to, to talk with you. And um, I, I can't wait to see uh, what you're going to create next out there in the water going forward. Thank you. It's great talking to you. Epic, epic. Well, have a great weekend. Guys, this has been episode 32 from Speaking From Water, I'm your host, Sean Rutke. We wish Dave an excellent evening, and I hope you have a great evening, day, night, uh, morning, wherever you're listening to this podcast, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Dave, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man. I hope we can uh, keep in touch over the social medias, and if I make it up, up that way, I'll, I'll uh, say what's up. And um, again, I'm in Wrightsville Beach. If you ever make it down here, uh, let me know. And I'd love to show you around. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I'll definitely, uh, hit you up if I'm down there. And if you're up this way, uh, yeah, definitely shoot me. Have text. you ever, have, have you ever been down here? Not that far. I've been to the outer banks. Um, I remember I had a friend that, uh, I went to Fiji with that was from like Emerald beach area. Um, and he was like, yeah, like our local guys, uh, Benny B like everyone loves him. <laughs> Dude, was like, he was yeah, on the like podcast uh, 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 three sessions ago. He's, yeah, he's I saw a, that. Off, off oh, the dope. Episode. Epic. Yeah, he's a legend, man. And super nice guy. Like Sam Hammer and him are kind of in the same generation. And the way you describe yeah. Sam is, is just like Ben, just like epic, epic person. But so, um, again, thank you again. And I uh, hope you have a great weekend, dude. Hey, and I apologize for my, my kids running in there at the beginning. I, I gave no them a good problem. talk like, hey. Yeah, I'm doing a podcast. Uh, keep you know, keep it down. But you know, four year old, nine year old, it's uh, they, <laughs> yeah, it's all woo, good. They, they don't listen. Yeah, <laughs> epic, bro. All right, all right, dude. have a good Peace. one.